So I'll, we'll start by talking about our project. Our project is called Urban Art Mapping. And Paul, could you go to the second slide? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and our project is dedicated to um, systematically documenting, mapping, and analyzing street art. We use this term really broadly to refer to graffiti and stickers and wheat paste and light projections, murals, things painted on plywood panel is part of our project. So really anything painted, drawn on, projected, or affixed to a permanent structure in the built environment. And because we're interested in graffiti and street art as a form of political discourse, we document and analyze many different examples, whether they're produced legally or illegally. We're an interdisciplinary team, we're multiracial, we're multi-generational, and we have collective backgrounds in folklore, cultural studies, geography, and art history that shape the core methodology of our project. So this slide shows some of the members of our team and some of the work that we do, which requires, um, you know, at its core, really building deep relationships with the community based on trust and respect. And from there, creating the living community archive of graffiti and street art focused on key points of conflict and crisis that shape the world we live in. It's experimental work. It's constantly changing. We approach it with a desire to embrace new methodologies and new ways of learning. Um, so these images show some of the work that we do on the top left, uh, some members of our team working with an activist in Washington, D.C., Nadine Saylor, uh, documenting Black Lives Matter street mural and other graffiti and street art in that area around the White House. And then on the top right is some graffiti from George Floyd Square. Uh, bottom left is a sticker from George Floyd Square. In the bottom in the center, that's some plywood with graffiti and then a painting on it uh, near the third precinct in Minneapolis that was uh, abandoned and burned um, in June of 2020. And then on the bottom right, this is George Floyd Square. It's members of our team working with an artist to repaint and refresh a street mural that's painted on, on the street in George Floyd Square. Uh, so those are some of the things that, that we we do in the community. With our work, we really seek to understand how place shapes graffiti and street art, and in turn, how graffiti and street art redefine and remake urban space in ways that generate political dialogue and amplify marginalized voices. We argue that graffiti and street art provide insights into cultural forces that are shaping urban spaces, and that these art forms are deeply embedded in the surrounding environment. So while it's clear that street art has the power to shape the urban landscape, this research that we're presenting today analyzes how the urban landscape shapes the geography of street art. So we ask, how does the street shape the art? And why is street art concentrated in some areas and absent in others? So next, just a couple of maps to situate where we're located. We're uh, in Minnesota, the state of Minnesota. The next slide shows you uh, how the rivers converge and where the Twin Cities are located. And then this slide shows you the Twin Cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul. So we're living and working. We're both right now in the city of St. Paul. Uh, and then there's Minneapolis, you can see, is right next door. So we really document and map broadly in this entire metro area for this project that we're talking about today. We started working together as a team in 2018 before the pandemic. And at that time, we were focusing on a neighborhood called Midway, a neighborhood in St. Paul that was undergoing a lot of transition that to people who lived in the neighborhood felt like gentrification. And so we were really investigating uh, how art was communicating that context. Uh, so in these images, you can see um, some members of our team out in the street uh, looking at documenting murals and graffiti. And then the image on the right shows uh, that's Todd Lawrence, our research partner on the right. On the left is Choma Yuagwu, one of our research students. And then in the center is Lori Green. So she's a, a, a muralist who lives and works in the Midway neighborhood who we were working with at that time. So our methodology and even our goals changed with the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis on May 25th, 2020. In the uprising that followed George Floyd's murder, we witnessed this an explosion of protest art in the streets here in the Twin Cities and around the world. And so we really sought to document that. And um, that image that you saw just a second ago, if you don't mind going back for one second, Paul, that image shows some work that is uh, we paced by the third precinct in Minneapolis. And then on the bottom right, that's a stencil at George Floyd Square. And at the top, that's chalk on a board, but that's at the Hennepin County Government Center at the time of jury selection when it was any kind of um, inter interactions with the wall space was really monitored and controlled. And so even writing with chalk was a risk. So the next slide shows you some global examples of the sorts of things that we're documenting um, coming from Syria and, and France. The top right is a, the pig face graffiti from and in St. Paul, right around the area of the protest. Um, examples of graffiti on a Confederate monument in Richmond, 
that really literally brought that sculpture down. So some of the things that we document are are shown here. It would have been impossible for us to go out and document all this art on the global level. So we we developed a model for documenting and archiving using crowdsourcing. And so from this, we built the George Floyd and Anti-Racist Street Art Database, which is an ongoing project and could be a topic of a different presentation. We won't have a lot of time to talk about it today. But this is a screenshot that shows you what it looks like. It contains about 35 examples of art created in protest um, since 2020, and it's it's always growing. Thanks, Heather. Um, we think street art has the ability to shape cultural landscapes, and I think we're seeing a go indi evidence from Go Indigo. Uh, evidence that street art has the power to remake our cities and alter our ideas about place. But our presentation is going to focus on the other side of this relationship. How does the city's geography shape the location and distribution of street art? So to find out, we're going to analyze city scale economic, demographic, and cultural processes that shape the location and distribution of non-sanctioned street art here in the Twin Cities. And uh, for the analysis part of this talk, we really have three sections. First, we're gonna, we did conduct a detailed survey of street art in one neighborhood, and Heather's going to talk about that just in, in just a second. And the point of that was to better understand how location shapes street art. Then we use the insights from the field work to create a site suitability model within the GIS system. And the goal of that analysis was to predict the location of street art hotspots for the entire Twin Cities metro area. And then thirdly, we use crowdsource data to test the strength of our model and use it to explore other factors that might shape the geography of street art. So to start this project, we, when we were working in the Midway neighborhood, we would go out in the streets with our students and we would take paper maps and we would mark every indication that we saw of graffiti stickers. Graffiti removal we recorded as well and, and murals and we recorded these on maps. And that's what you can see in this particular image here. And then, oh, Paul, do you want to go ahead? Sorry. Oh, you want me to do this one? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, so we had the information from paper maps. We entered that into ArcGIS Pro, created G a geo database through digita digitizing all of, all of our maps. And that allowed us to conduct spatial analysis and generate maps like the one on the right, which depicts hotspots of street art. As we were walking through the neighborhood, uh, we noticed that street art was clustered in some areas and not others. So we were able to look at factors in the landscape that were co-located with street art. Um, so we generated map layers here, and we're, we're interested in this pattern of street art. Where is it located? What are underlying social, economic, geographic, environmental processes that shape it? And so you can see some of those variables here that we think matter in the geography of street art. Things like distance from main intersections, distance from grass and trees, distance from transit stops, zoning seem to really matter as well. When you put those together, you can start to look at relationships between these variables. So once we mapped them, we were able to assess the relationship of street art density. This slide's an example of that work. Uh, here's street art density and distance from main intersections. They're, they appear to be correlated. And you can see in the scatter plot at right, each point's a location in the neighborhood. Yellow points are street art hotspots, blue points are cold spots. And main intersections tend to be street art hotspots. And as distance from main intersection increases, street art becomes increasingly scarce. We had lots of scatter plots. This was one of the most interesting ones. Um, you can see here, it indicates the transit stops are co-located with street art, especially when they're near main intersections. So we gained lots of insight about the geography of street art in this one neighborhood. And in the second stage of the project, we use insights from our field work to build, build a predictive model for the geography of street art in the entire Twin Cities metro area. <laughs> so one of the things I really enjoy about being part of a multidisciplinary team is we're taking ideas from a wide range of perspectives. And when I'm not talking about street art with Heather and Todd, I, I work on environmental with environmental organizations uh, to protect endangered species. And in this model, uh, we're looking at the geography. We're, so today we're looking at the geography of street art. And to do that, we are using insights from methods used by conservation biologists. 
So what you can see here is these biologists are working to predict the location and habitat for an endangered species using suitability models. Our project follows the methods to find ideal habitat for street art. If it's good to study natural landscapes to find out where lions are, maybe it's good to analyze urban landscapes to find out where street art is. So biologists are focusing on variables like terrain and climate. We're going to focus on variables like transit stops and distance from intersections. And in this site suitability model, each map depicts one variable or one underlying process that shapes the pattern of where mountain lion habitat is. In combination, maps provide really detailed insight into the landscape, and they can estimate hotspots where lions are likely to be found. So what we're going to do is use these methods to see if we could use variables from the Twin Cities to make hotspots of, of street art. So the next few slides, they're going to depict some of the variables that we think shape the habitat or the geography of street art in the Twin Cities. Um, this slide shows that our model favors areas near transit stops. And this is all performed in ArcGIS Pro in the site suitability modeling suite of tools. Um, you know, we're also predicting the relatively high poverty rates are associated with the presence of street art. That's one of the things we found from our field survey. And for the people who do statistics, you can see in these slides, GIS uh, allows us to standardize variables and basically assign weights to each one. We think land use is another important variable. You can see here, uh, for example, we were smart enough to say uh, street art shouldn't appear in runways and lakes, but it does appear in areas that are zoned for things like retail and commercial. We also consider race in our midway uh, neighborhood in our study area. Street art appeared to be found in areas with higher percentage of minority residents. You can see here, we think population density is also associated with the presence of street art. Zoning matters as well. Home, home ownership seems to matter, especially single family homes. And what the model does is basically push street art away from single family homes. And there's a few other variables, but when you each one of these variables is basically a map. And if you overlay the maps, each one gives you insight into the landscape and in concert, this is what we ended up with for the seven county metro area for the Twin Cities. So all those variables are overlaid. And what, what our model is doing is predicting that street art's gonna cluster in the green areas in the downtown, and it's largely absent in the red areas, which are mostly suburban. So you can see, I don't know if you can see my mouse here. There's the two downtowns, Minneapolis and St. Paul. There's sort of a suburban donut around the city, and the model's predicting that we're gonna find far fewer uh, instances of street art there. In just a second, I'll hit the button and we'll zoom in to the downtowns for a little more detailed look at that. So this is the view of the neighborhoods closer to downtown St. Paul, Minneapolis. And you can also see the location in the Midway neighborhood where we conducted our field work. So basically, we walked around one neighborhood, got insights about street art, and extrapolated to the whole city. So this is where we estimate hotspots are going to be. Um, in the third stage of the project, and we're still working on this a bit, um, we started to test the accuracy of our GIS model by mapping the locations of crowdsourced street art from our urban art mapping project. So uh, the, the database, this urban art mapping project that basically Heather put together has thousands and thousands of crowdsourced uh, locations for street art. This is over, I think the last count, this is about 1,700 or 1,800 points in the Twin Cities. So each dot represents crowdsourced street art. And when you take that data and put it into the GIS, you get this map. And what that shows uh, is the pattern, it's the observed pattern to crowdsource street art in our downtowns and neighborhoods. So areas in yellow are where street art's clustered. You can see there really is a geography to street art. It's not randomly distributed across the landscape. It's, it's really tightly clustered. So these are observed. And if you look um, at the next slide, th these are our predicted hotspots and the, those appear in green. And we're pretty, you know, it's working pretty well. We're pleased to see actual hotspots are generally found in the green areas. I think I can go back to. It's not perfect though. While hotspots generally appear in the areas we predict, 
some green areas have relatively low levels of street art. You can see that in this, the yellow areas in the northwest and the southeast. And, you know, we think that's partly due to the fact that our crowdsource data isn't evenly sampled across the study area. Um, these are poor and more minority neighborhoods, and we think that they just might be undersurveyed. We have been in these places. We know street art's there. It just hasn't appeared in, in our database. So there's lots of ways to look at the relationship between the predicted hotspots in our model and where they actually are in our geo database. So this is a 3D map. And it's designed to show the relationship between observed and estimated street art. Yellow areas still depict uh, observed street art hotspots from our database, but the height of the landscape, it's based on our model predictions. So the low-lying areas are lakes, they're parks, they're runways. Areas that appear a little bit more spiky are the areas we expect to find street art. I'll just zoom in here a bit. So the view here suggests that there's several other factors that our model doesn't take into account. Geography of street art evolves over time. One thing that we've noticed is, or one thing we were thinking about right now is that we surveyed the Midway neighborhood before George Floyd was murdered. But most of the art uploaded to our crowdsource database focused on racial justice, and it was generated after George Floyd was killed. So we think this might have something to do with the unexpectedly high concentrations of street art in fewer hot spots than we predicted. So if you look here, for example, uh, in the area in the, inside the yellow circle, this is the most intense street art hotspot in the Twin Cities. And it turns out that that's where George Floyd was killed. That's George Floyd Square. And you can sort of see what that's what that's like. Another really strong street art cluster is along that straight line. And that's, uh, you know, that's uh, Lake Street. And that's one of the areas where the civil protests took place after George Floyd was murdered. And uh, it's, it's a mixed use neighborhood. There's lots of shops. And we basically saw an explosion of street art there along that commercial artery. The store owners covered up the windows with plywood. And that plywood basically say, served as a blank slate for street art. And that's some examples of that. So when you run a little bit of st statistics, there's sort of a story about the geography of street art in the Twin Cities. And at least for our study area with the variables we used compared to the crowdsource data, um, our model tells about 40% of the story. So the model doesn't predict everything. And that's, that's fine because one of the things we really like about street art is the fact that it's quirky, that it's unexpected, it's pretty rebellious, unsanctioned, in some cases, just unpredictable. So this is where we're at right now. Sort of when we put this together, when we're thinking about the geography of street art, you know, our days are evolving over time. Um, the lower half depicts citywide factors, such as the ones that appeared in our GIS model, and they do tell part of the story. But the upper half of the model here indicates a wide array of local factors, attitudes, and situations. They all seem equally important, and they're much less predictable. We think these are going to vary from one place to the other. Get the next. So why does geography of street art matter? We think street art provides insights into culture, power, urban landscapes. When you pay attention to street art, it gives it access to a wide range of different perspectives, a more nuanced understanding of the conversations that really matter to the artists in the street, and, the land, and gives us insight into the landscapes where we live. So we think the geography of street art matters because our interpretation of art, it's shaped by the setting it's viewed in. We think that the meaning of the art can shift with the location. And once you start thinking about the relationship between place and art, you might have a fuller understanding of the spatial context and we think that can deepen connections with both art and the urban landscape. We really wish we were in Vienna with you, seeing some of the amazing street art photos that you have. And um, I think we're, we're both, Heather and I, are really interested in uh, how the street art, the geography of street art might change from one location to the next. So if we have time, it'd be really interesting to see, uh, to hear from you 
what variables you might put in for the street art in, in places that you care about. <laughs> we covered a lot uh, really quickly. Um, if you have questions, happy to answer those in a moment. Uh, Heather's email, my email, and David Todd Lawrence's email is there. And we'd also encourage you, if you're interested at all, please take a look at like our George Floyd anti-racist street art database. It has thousands of uploaded street art images from all over the world. I don't know if we're at every continent yet. We're waiting for we're waiting for one from Antarctica and one from Antarctica, but um, we think it's a potentially useful resource. So I think with that, we'll stop and and see if you have questions. Thank you very much for this very interesting insight. Uh, I will start the discussion right away. If there are any questions? Albert Ronald, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I understood it correctly, and there is sort of a moral component in this model yet. Because uh, uh, you are already actually to uh, the George Floyd of the murder, right? And of course, uh, you may expect that uh, in the appearance of street artists, you can see that based also has a JRP and then maybe it in, in security. So, do so you see a, model, a way to extend your model to uh, incorporate a temporal component? I thought the question was understandable because I, I barely I'm sorry I barely heard it. Okay, so the question was about um, the temporal component. If the temporal component is included in the mm -hmm. model, especially depending on events like um, George Floyd's murder, so it's really temporal based. And so, if you consider this aspect of temporality, yes. Yeah, I think I have your question. Um, no, so. Basically, the variables we predict or we use to predict the location distribution of street art were based on the survey that we did one point in time. And, I, and basically that survey was done over maybe a three month period with faculty and students. So yeah, there's not really, a not at least in the GIS portion of this, um, there's not. But that's kind of interesting too. I mean, for us, we're really interested in how space and place shapes art. You get the geography of art, art can shape place. There's this back and forth between people and the environment that shapes landscapes. So kind of the cool thing about this is it never ends. If you could figure out what's going on with the geography of street art in one place at one time, great. But then you come back later and you get to do the analysis again because there's this ever of these landscapes just evolve over time. So I think a really interesting question would be uh, what's this, you know, what variables matter today? What matters? Are some of them going to matter tomorrow? Which ones persist and which ones are going to change over time? So here in the Twin Cities, unfortunately, because of George Floyd, uh, factors related to social justice really tended to shape, we think, the pattern and location of street art and also the content. So I don't know if that gets at your, your question. Yeah. <laughs> the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I want to chime in too and say I agree. It's a really interesting question when we talked about quite a bit about this temporal nature of, of uh, where things appear. And, um, you know, we've thought about this uprising and how that shaped the graffiti and street art that appeared at that time, but also about different moments of increased tolerance or intolerance in any particular city. And, you know, here in the Twin Cities in the summer of 2020, there was more tolerance for street art from the uh, perspective of um, the from the legal perspective, simply because there were so many other things happening at that time. And that's happened in other cities as well. And then there's periods of less tolerance. So I think doing a temporal model that also considered what is happening in terms of tolerance and attitudes towards street art in any given location would be really interesting. Super interesting. We haven't done that yet. <laughs> yeah. If you look in the if you look in the database, the George Floyd anti-racist street art database, you can pull art by topic mm -hmm. and by time. And one of the things we've done is uh, if you look at the change in the street art over time, right after George Floyd was killed, was murdered, the tone and the nature of the street art was much more, it was, there was a lot more anger. It was much more visceral, focused on the police. And over time, as we get farther away in time from that event, the tone changed to more like building community and things like that. We also did a little bit of work. There were some hot spots of unrest. There's this geography of street art with George Floyd. In areas where there was unrest, the tone of the street art in those places near areas where, for example, there was arson, it was much more angry. 
then as you got farther and farther away into the suburbs or was much more focused on building coalitions and working together and things like that. So it's something we could do, maybe, Heather? I, uh, I didn't want to interrupt you. <laughs> uh, for the next question, so I would invite, so maybe to come to the microphone of the any. Art. Yeah. Why is there a need to predict street art locations? Did you hear the question? Yeah. Okay. So we had all this data and I ran some regressions and things like that. It, it's, it feels a little weird to actually do statistical analysis on street art because in the way you're missing the point of what the artists are trying to do. So we're not really... This is sort. This is done in a multidisciplinary way. Um, we're trying to combine perspectives to understand street art. We're trying to explore street art, and we're playing around with this in a little bit. So the point wasn't to get a, a really well specified OLS regression analysis that just nailed it. Um, we do know that there's several variables that we could add that would make the model stronger. But for us, uh, it's great to go out and explore in person with students street art, but it's also kind of fun to explore street art, the data surrounding street art, the patterns of street art and to try and quantify that. So this is this is sort of more of a playful exercise that gave us, that we conducted to better understand the geography of street art, the context of street art. Um, we're we're learning from the from the the misses in the model where it wasn't well specified. I don't know that we're really going to sit down and try and get the perfect regression analysis. You know, as a geographer, I would hope that the model that works really well for the Twin Cities wouldn't work for Vienna because their history and their culture and their values are so they're so different. But I think if we ran the same model in Vienna. It would be really interesting to see where there's agreement and where there's disagreement. So, yeah, I don't think it's important to have a, a perfect model with a really high square R square value, but I do think that we're gaining insights by doing this type of analysis that we wouldn't otherwise gain. Another question from Liliana. Hello. Um, I'm Liliana. Uh, I have a question regarding this uh, model that you developed, especially for for this um, thing that happened with uh, George Floyd. But did you have afterwards anything similar that you can compare it to? For example, maybe some uh, natural disaster because that's, mm. that's been happening since 2020, or something uh, similar that might uh, inspire street artists to work more or um, in a manner that they were working when uh, it was related to this uh, uh, George Floyd issue. You want to talk about COVID? Or yeah, well, you know that would be before too. But we don't have a we don't have a similar model to compare it to. Um, we do also track uh, street art related to COVID nineteen, although that certainly has dissipated, you know, in the time since yeah. then. Uh, another one that we haven't really been able to track systematically yet, but I think would be an interesting comparative case would be reproductive rights street art. That's something that we've just started to look at. But there are certainly these key moments like the overturning of Roe versus Wade last last June, um, where there is a kind of explosion of dialogue in street art about a particular topic. Um, but we haven't done a model of that yet. a really good question. I mean, it's really, I mean, one of the underlying ideas is that cultural change, when a landscape changes, the cultural process is the shape that have changed too. So you can actually walk around the city, look for changes in the city, like geographic Sherlock Holmes might, to see how changes in the culture might be affecting that. So it's sort of a clue to things like this. So it'd be really interesting to work on. Yeah, 